basically sort of a roundtable discussion in which we kind of bat around ideas. Um, certainly you're going to be the focal point and we want to really hear from you on, on whatever subjects kind of you get sparked by okay. in the course of conversation. No problem. And, um, and then we'll just kind of run with it and see how it goes. Something that I would like to say is that I think we get more emails and have done over the three years that we've been going asking us to interview you and wondering if there's some weird reason why we haven't uh, than Never got else. together. <laughs> but here we are. It's all synchronistic in the end. Absolutely. In the end. And so we're here in Sedona and um, you're here and it was great that we were able to connect with you. Great. Um, so where we want to go with this is we have whistleblowers and I'm curious, have you got your own sort of secret sources that have been giving you information through the years? No. Um, what happened to me is I had a, an extraordinary um, experience or series of experiences in the early 1990s. I um, was a television presenter and a national spokesman of the British Green Party and um, suddenly um, I felt over 1989 that there was a a presence in the room whenever I was alone um, and it became more and more tangible as 1989 unfolded. It was bizarre really because um, the Green Party in Britain had a, their biggest electoral year in 1989 at a European elections and I was going through all this while um, whenever I was in a room alone like a hotel room or something there was this presence you know and eventually um, uh, it got so powerful towards the end of 89, that I was sitting on the side of a bed in a, in a hotel called the Kensington Hilton in London, just down from the BBC I know. headquarters. And I said to this apparently empty room, look, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you'll drive me up the wall. About um, two weeks later, it must have been, I'm uh, with my son. He was a little boy then. He's, he's a singer-songwriter now in mid-20s. Six foot uh, four. Right. Yeah, this is uh, Gaz and Gareth, and um, we, were, we were playing football, and we were going to go down into the town to get some lunch. I live in a, on a seaside resort in a place called the Isle of Wight in England. And as we got down towards this greasy Joe Caff, somebody, some railway worker, stopped me and started talking about football, because I was on the television talking about sport and stuff. And then after this conversation was finished, I, I, I saw that G uh, Gareth wasn't there. I knew where he would be. He'd be in the news shop just down next to us. So I walked in. And um, he was reading the steam train books, because he liked steam trains, certainly like me. And uh, I said to him, come on, come on, Gaz, we'll, we'll go and get some lunch. And, and as I turned, my feet wouldn't move. Now, this is a guy who's not been into any of this stuff. He's a television presenter and national spokesman with the Green Party, a journalist, basically. And um, my feet wouldn't move. And I heard, well, it's really a voice, but a, a very strong thought form passed through my mind, which, which didn't seem attached to me. Why would I think it? And it said, go and look at the books on the far side. So um, I went over and in among the romantic novels was this book with a woman's face on the front. And I, I picked it up because it was so different to the rest. Turned it over, saw the word psychic. So I read this book in 24 hours and um, I wrote to her, I went to see her. And uh, for, I, what I told her was, I had arthritis, which I have, and maybe her hands-on healing would help. I told her not the real reason I went which was, would she pick up what the heck this presence is I've been feeling for nearly a year. Well, actually, for a year by then. And um, went to the first couple of times, and it was sort of four times, and she did the hands-on healing, and we had a chat about other dimensions and stuff. All made sense to me. Because I'd always rejected religion, and I'd always rejected uh, the scientific view of reality. I just hadn't focused on, what's well, okay, so what's the alternative? And then the third time I went, um, I'm lying there on this medical-type bench thing, and I felt like a spider's web on my face. 
which really took me aback because I'd read in her book that um, when other dimensions or whatever spirits or whatever you want to use are trying to lock into you, you sometimes feel like a spider's web on your face. Well, funnily enough, I never had before and I never have since, but at that moment, seriously powerful, real tangible. So I'm going, oh my goodness me, what's going on? And she's kind of doing it, doing this, but by my left knee. And I never said a word to her. And then suddenly um, she launches her head back and goes, my God, I've got to close my eyes for this one. This is powerful. And she sees this, um, this figure in her mind and uh, she says, this, 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 this figure, or whatever she called it, is, is asking me to pass information to you. And take into account, you know, I'm a, I'm a television presenter presenting the sport and the news at the time. And suddenly uh, she starts saying that um, I, uh, this, this entity or this projection of consciousness um, was saying that I was going to go out on a world stage eventually and reveal great secrets. That there was a shadow across the world that had to be lifted that um, there was going to be a spiritual revolution in my lifetime because of a vibrational change. Um, that's why the first book I wrote was called Truth Vibrations, after that vibrational change. And that um, one line was, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that will change the world. I would write five books in three years. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know nothing <laughs> about this stuff. Five books in three years, you must be having a laugh. You know, and I, this is all new to me. Uh, I wrote five books in three years to the month, and I didn't realize I'd done it until I realized it was five and then went back. It was five books to the month of three years um, from that time. And I went back another time and, and the next time, and there was some more. Um, so I left and waited something felt right about it even though my mind's going what what um within weeks um the bbc had decided they weren't going to renew my contract even though i was the youngest one in their department i was in by a mile presenter and um it would seem that i would have had a lifetime working lifetime future there when i look back and at that thought I, my my emotional chakra, you know, starts vibrating wildly. The thought of being in the media all my life. Oh my God, when I look back, nightmare. Anyway, um, so now I'm out of work. But I, 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 I feel I have to go with this. Um, unfortunately, I've always lived below my income because I have a very, you know, I'm minimalist me. I'd rather, I'd rather have the money to go to India than a big house with a mortgage, you know. Anyway. Um, so I had enough money um, to keep me going for a year. And then it all started. This synchronistic, um, almost daily, um, this daily journey through a maze. And, and, and when I started out, it was a thick maze. I had no idea what this was all about. I just felt I had to go with it. I didn't even know why I had to go with it. I just, I just got to go with this. And what's happened is um, it's like some force has been opening and closing doors. So I go down this road in the maze and not this one. And so c coming around to, you know, answering a question directly, um, I just follow and have followed now for nearly 20 years this pulsing, this urging, this knowing that passes through me. Um, so uh, I will, um, I edit my life on the basis of that. Um, will you go here? Don't feel to. Will you go here? Yeah, I feel, I'll, I'll be there. And what has happened uh, as a result of just doing that, it's happened uh, as a result of just doing that, it's happened uh, as a result of just doing that, it's happened uh, as a result of just doing that. It's happened uh, as a result of just doing that. It's happened uh, as a result of just doing that. It's happened uh, as a result of just doing that. It's happened uh, as a result of just doing that. It's happened uh, as a result of just doing that. Had almost, experience. almost in the right order that you can encompass them in the picture most easily. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, First of all, in the early years of the 90s and through to about 1996, 
all the synchronicity was about the five sense level of this conspiracy. Banking scams, families connecting, um, same people behind this and behind that and behind that, who's behind the drug uh, uh, networks and all that stuff. Banking uh, uh, families and uh, engineered wars, what was really behind the Second World War, the First World War, what, and what's this, and then what's this, um, this network that, that is the, the uh, guiding force of this conspiracy, all that stuff. And then from about 96, when I came to America to talk about this for the first time, and um, <clears throat> lots of people turned up. I, I talked to eight people in Chicago, I remember that. Um, it was a real, that was what you might call an expeditionary three months because I was talking to myself most of the time. But <clears throat> I was picking up information as I passed around. And what started then from 96 onwards was the next stage of this, which is these families that um, I'd learned so much about in, in the years before um, were actually connected to some non-human um, race or entities which, for which they were basically fronting up an agenda within this five sense reality. That's when I uh, went into the whole reptilian stuff. And of course, uh, the synchronicity of, of, of my life and my journey, personal journey, and my communication of information are fundamentally connected because part of my, a uh, massive part of my life is as I've been learning more and more, you know, my, my personal journey has been clearing out my own body computer programming so that, uh, you, you know, I can access higher and higher levels of consciousness. Of course, every, everyone's got the opportunity to do that. And many people are doing it now. So I've had great challenges in my life at the same time as doing the information to break this up. And one of the break this, these programs up, and w one of the biggest ones happened um, in 1991 when I started talking about what was happening to me. And of course, I was a well-known television presenter in Britain, so there was monumental ridicule uh, of a kind that, you know, few people can actually have experienced. I mean, uh, I would walk down the street and uh, be laughed at by most of the people in the street for like two, three years. Uh, a, a comedian only had to say my name, no joke necessary, get a laugh. But can we, can we go back to that? Because I'd love to get, you know, to sort of drill down and, and find out what, how did you actually get into the reptilian situation? Well, yeah, what, what I was just going to say, the reason I bring this up is about the synchronicity of my life. is because from 96, when I started going to the reptilian stuff, because I'd been through that mass ridicule in the early 1990s, um, it had cleared me out of the key thing that most people live in, the prison that most people live in, which is the fear of what other people think. Um, therefore, to me, coming out in, from the late 90s about the reptilian stuff was not a problem, because so the level of ridicule could not be greater than what is before. But why did you have ridicule before? Because the only ridicule I knew was about the reptilian. Oh, no. I mean, I... I, I um, I'll tell you, tell you another, another story that, that leads into that. Um, towards the end of 1990, when I had finished the book Truth Vibrations and it went off to the publisher to be published in the, the spring of, two, of um, 1991, uh, I had this overwhelming feeling, again, the urge, the impulse, to go to Peru. And um, I... I had no idea why, I just had to go to Peru. So I get on a plane to Peru, not knowing why I'm going there. And, and I'm, I, I land in Lima Airport, and from the moment I landed, amazing synchronistic things happened. Um, but eventually, um, I had this Peruvian guy chat that was taking me around. And funnily enough, the, the first time I met that guy was in Cusco, in the old Inca region. And I went round to his house, because we were going off traveling around Peru from that day. And he's lying on his back and um, asleep. And I walked in because the door was open. And he looked up at me and he said, um, not hello, but do you have any dreams last night? What? I said, well, actually, I did. I said, I had a real big, clear, technicolor dream that one of these two front teeth fell out. I can't remember which one. And he said, is your father or grandfather still alive? I said, well, my father is, yeah. I said, why? He said, well, that's usually symbolic of your father or your grandfather dying. I thought, well, this guy's going to be a bunch of laughs for the next three weeks. <laughs> and, uh, 
Wow. When I next got a call out of Peru, my father had died back in England. Oh my God. Somebody, anyway, I, I go around with this guy and where it all leads, which kind of fundamentally leads to the reason behind a ridicule, um, was he eventually um, put us in a hotel put a, a, called the Siustani in Puno. It's kind of southern Peru, not far from Lake Titicaca. And the Siustani Hotel was named after an Inca ruin site about an hour, an hour and a half's drive away. So there's pictures of this place all over the hotel, the ruins. And I said, I said to the guy, I want to go there. So we go out, and I think he did a deal, get some money out of me, because I, I, go, I go out in like a, a, a little tourist bus with windows on the side with a tourist bus driver and the, uh, the guy and me, nobody else. And we go out to this place, and it's in the middle of nowhere. And basically, when you looked around, um, it was encircled by mountains in the distance, mind. And um, I go there. The only people there are a couple of children with llamas for tourist photographs, but they were no tourists. So I walk around for about an hour, and it's very nice. It's on a hill, a lagoon on three sides. And I go back to the, the car, and, and I'm, it was nice, but it didn't match the urge I had to go there. So I get in the, the van thing, and we start to drive away. And I'm looking out the window daydreaming. And I look, I see this mound to my right, but must be no more than three minutes down the road. And as I look at the mound, all I can hear in my head is, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. What? Because this is, I'm really new to this stuff. I mean, what's going on with my life? So I said to the guy, can you stop the van? Because uh, the bus thing, I'm, I'm going up the, the mound. Um, so I went up the mound. I couldn't see it from the road. But when I got to the top, there was a circle of standing stones about waist high these stones were obviously been there a very very long time so i walk into the middle of this circle and i'm looking across to see Ustani and across to the distant mountains and it's a it's a piercing hot peruvian day no clouds not a cloud in the sky very much like this one today um and i walk to the, the center of the circle and suddenly my feet go again like they did in the new shop but only seriously more powerful this, they're like magnets pulling my feet to the ground. And I think, oh, crikey, I recognize that. Here we go. And then I felt like a drill going in the top of my head and through my body, through my feet into the ground, and then another one coming the other way. And then my arms go out at 45 degrees like that. I never made any decision to do it. Hmm. And of course, you, 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 you hold your arms out there for, you know, a minute. It starts to ache, what my shoulders do anyway. I, I, it was the best part of an hour. It must be 45 minutes to an hour, my arms were like that. And when it was over, my shoulders were agony, but when it was going on, nothing. And what then started to happen is this energy coming through me, this is um, February 1991, um, got more and more powerful. My body started to shake with it. And the, uh, I had um, two... Um, very powerful thought forms has passed through my head, just like in the new shop. The first one said, they'll be talking about this 100 years from now. And I'm thinking, talking about what? And the other one was, it will be over when you feel the rain. I've just described what the weather was like. It will be over when you feel the rain. I mean, you're having a laugh, mate. Um, so what happened then for the next 45 minutes? Because time disappeared. There was no time. I worked it out later. Um, was that this energy just kept coming through me. And I kept going in and out of, if you like, awareness, consciousness, like driving a car and you go, crikey, where did the last two miles go? Mm -hmm. One of these times when I came back to kind of awareness, I noticed that over the distant mountains there was a light gray mist. And I kind of, as I watched it, it got darker and darker very quickly. And I realized it was pouring with rain over the distant mountain. And over the next little while, however long it was, I watched this storm come out of the mountains. And people, whether, whether people talk about a, you know, a, a weather front, well, this was a straight line. The cloud was a straight line. I've described it many times as like drawing the, drawing the uh, curtains across the sky. And I, this thing's coming towards me. And as it got closer, the sun's gone and it's been covered. And all the clouds are billowing. And I'm seeing faces in the clouds. It didn't make any sense to me, but I saw faces in the clouds. And then... It's a wall of rain. I'm watching it coming towards me. And by this time, I'm hanging on, you know, with this thing coming through, this energy coming through me. And eventually it hits me. Torrential rain. And everything stopped. And that's when I staggered forward and my, my shoulders were agony and all the rest of it. 
um, and many other things happened. But when I came back to England after that, as I said earlier, my my book was published uh, in the early part of 1991, which is you know a matter of a sh very short time after this uh, experience. And when I look back now, um, it was like, you know, if you've got a, a dam and it's holding water back, well, the water is calm, right? Because that's its, that's its natural state in that situation, if you like. But when the dam bursts, before a new balance is found um, after the dam bursts, all hell breaks loose mm -hmm. in the water. Right, as it's trying to go from one state to another. Yep. When I look back, what happened to me on that mound? It was like um, the waters of my mind bursting. And for three months, I didn't know what planet I was on. Right. In the middle of this, my book came out, um, and I went on the biggest um, chat show live chat show in Britain at the time, it's called The Wogan Show, um, in a complete bloody daze about what was happening to me. And it had all been in the national papers that basically I'd gone crazy. And um, I was sitting in this chair in the chat show um, and the audience were laughing within a minute, two minutes. And they basically laughed for I think I must have been on about 15, 17, 16, 17 minutes. And from that moment on, because um, I was talking about what was happening to me, except I didn't understand what was happening to me. Uh, and what that did was trigger the most extraordinary levels of ridicule. And uh, it, it, it cleared me out of that fear of what other people think. But I learned so much about human behavior. I remember because what you're supposed to do when you face that scale of ridicule is, is run and hide, right? And it's uh, one of the means that's used to control us all. Yeah, so what I did mm. is I, w I went on a university speaking tour <laughs> and, and in front of all these students who had not come to listen, they'd come to laugh, right? My understanding is that what you had is a Kundalini experience. Do you relate to it like that or do you call it something else? I don't care. But have you investigated or has anyone no. talked to you about that? No, I mean, I've talked to people about a Kundalini experience and, and, and maybe it was. See, what, what, I, what I do, I can only talk for myself, is um, what is, is. You know, one of the things that was said um, to me by the psychic or through the psychic in 1990 when all this started for me was they're saying you will face enormous opposition, but they will always be there to protect you. Now, I don't know who they are. I don't, I've hardly even um, thought about who they are. Because when I leave this genetic spacesuit, um, I will know who they are. Um, all I do is I go with my intuition. And what happened to me in 1991 with the great ridicule was, as life so often does, it gave me my uh, 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 my greatest gift, brilliantly disguised as my worst nightmare, because that's what it was at the time in the experience of it. So what actually happened to me is something transformed my uh, sense of perception. And that's good enough for me. Mm. I don't really w have to know the detail of what happened, but and Kundalini the, experience, it could well have been, yeah. And in the meantime, it's got something to do with tempering the steel. Say again? Tempering the steel. T tempering the steel, yeah. Um, because, uh, as I keep coming back to, my personal journey and what I'm doing in terms of communicating information are absolutely at one. Um, I was, I was going to say, what, what, ha what happened to me when I went out on that university speaking tour, I was at a, uh, a university in Nottingham, and there were a thousand people there. Um, I would say 950 had come to laugh. And I walked out on the stage, and it was literally the best part of 15 minutes before I could speak because it was just abuse, ridicule, uh, laughter, um, um, plastic beer glasses thrown at the stage. And I just stood there uh, and waited for it to die down because it had to eventually.
And when it did, I said, um, you think I'm mentally ill, don't you? And you know what it's like. Yeah. And I said, so what does that say about you? Because you've actually paid to come here to ridicule <laughs> someone you believe is mentally ill. I tell you what, you could hear a pin drop. And you could hear a pin drop for the rest of the night. And it's uh, to do what, what I do, what I've done in terms of talking about some really bizarre things. And, you know, my name is still only has to be mentioned in a national newspaper in Britain. And it's like complete ridicule, whatever I'm saying. So it's turned around a bit. A little bit, but not very much. I mean, I, I stood for election uh, in, a, in a parliamentary by-election um, in, uh, was it July last year? To July 2008, not to get elected. I knew I wouldn't get any votes. I didn't want any votes. I mean, I must be the first um, uh, parliamentary candidate ever to put out a leaflet to everyone in the constituency saying, I don't want your votes, just your brief attention. Goodness me, I didn't want to, want to get involved in that. But, but again, it was a great experience and I learned a lot from it. Uh, but the, the media coverage was, I, I did a, a media presentation for the national press, which was about, I don't know, 50 minutes. PowerPoint pictures and stuff in which I talked about the five cents level of it because anything else I mean, I mean that blew their bloody minds anything else reptilians I think crikey and what they did is they just went away and and, um, and just abused me and abused it and ridiculed me and ironically the one that did the most abuse um, one of the things I said was coming actually um, about six weeks later was actually the front page story in his own newspaper uh, I mean, it's bizarre. These people have total cognitive dissonance um, so that they can't put these two things together. So it's still there, but it doesn't matter, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we're in a situation where, um, thanks to the Internet, we can bypass these um, sad people that work um, uh, with their concrete minds in the and mainstream media. And you don't have to reach everybody, just enough people. It's a hundred monkey thing. Yeah, I'll tell you what I feel. Uh, more and more, you know. Um, I mean, look, I can feel it. When I speak, anyone speaks, it's a vibrational communication. There's silence between you and me. There's silence when you speak to me until my brain's decoded it. And what it is, it's vibrational communication. And I, I feel very strongly that it's not just um, the people that hear this information. It's the fact that this information is circulating. If you do an interview for a radio station, um, 100,000 people might listen to it, but that broadcast um, frequency, carrying that information, is passing um, through the, the ether, if you like, um, and is there to be potentially picked up by um, people who don't even listen to the radio interview, and it touches them on a vibrational level. And, I, and, and, and you know, I think that's right. You're talking yeah. about the butterfly effect, in essence. Yeah. It, it, you the, know, multiplied. And, and that's, that's actually a very good way to put it. That, that it actually, you know, on a subliminal level, because we exist on so many different mm, levels. Exactly. That, that it, it's like waves. It's actually, it's hitting them. And, you know, there's a line that I, I've been quoting lately that says, you know, we learn by osmosis just as much as by, you know, word. It actually permeates. Just by osmosis, yeah. into our skin, into our brain. Ex Ex that we're, we're, exactly. We're receivers. Exactly. We're receiver transmitters. That's what we are. Um, um, but people think that the only form of communication is voice to ear. I'll tell you a funny story. I was, I, in 2003, I was in um, the rainforest of Brazil, and I took this ayahuasca psychoactive drug. It's the only time I've ever taken a psychoactive drug. Glad I did, though. It was fantastic. I mean, a lot of people have bad experience, but... Uh, this female voice talked to me as loud as mine is now for five hours about how reality, physical reality, is an illusion. Absolutely riveting stuff. Very, very funny. I mean, my feet were in the air a couple of times. It was so funny what, what, what was coming out. And um, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that, as the voice was telling me things, I, I saw pictures of, of obviously, we're being projected. And um, there was one where I, was, I walked out on a stage and there was an audience. I just saw the front of the audience here. And this voice said, um, you only speak words to keep the mind happy, basically to keep the left brain happy. And as this voice was saying to me this, I saw two, two women in the front row of this scene that had been projected to me. 
And I'd walked out the front of the stage and I'd just stood there and just said nothing, silence. And after a while, this, this one woman goes to the, nudges the other one like that and goes, basically, what's, what's he doing? And the voice, I, it's, it, it's so funny when it, when it, when it was said, because it came out of nowhere. The voice said, you only speak because if you did not, the audience would be asking, when the fuck is he going to start? <laughs> and uh, that actually uh, carries a profound uh, kind of understanding because the real communication between all of us is unspoken. And, and this is very good news. And, and this is what I, you know, I would impress upon people. Um, the more you speak your truth, um, even if people are not listening, you're, you're changing or, or offering a vibrational uh, field which other people can tune into. You know, when I, when I look at the speed at which um, people are awakening, um, it's not just because of information on the internet. It's not just because of information in my books or someone else's books. There's, there's something massive going on uh, vibrationally which fits totally with what, that, what I got through that psychic in 1990, um, which was there is a spiritual revolution coming and it's taking the form of a vibrational change. Um, I can see it. In 1990, no evidence. Now, I mean, please, it's a, it, it, you can see it. I had people come up to me in L.A. when I spoke there um, recently um, saying um, I was absolutely um, a part of the system until three months ago. Yeah. Right. I read one of your books yeah. and suddenly I, everything, I, I'm just totally different. Now, it's not just because they read one of my books. There's, a, there's, there's a, if you start tuning into this vibrational change, then bang, things can happen real, real quick. And you know, I, I, I personally, I, I find it a, 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 such a good thing that, that from my experience, I went through all that that nightmare experience in the early 1990s when I uh, uh, started to awake not knowing what the hell was happening. Because now you can explain to people that um, if, 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 if you have an energetic construct here, um, which was you believing everything was real and the system was serving you and this is the cutting edge of human evolution and all this nonsense, um, that vibrational field is vibrating your state of being out and it will draw to you people, places, ways of life, experiences, etc., locations which fit your inner self, because the outer self is a projection of the inner self. So when you tra start to transform, this is what happened to me, but I mean, it happens to everybody, um, to another um, state of being, uh, which then draws to you a very different group of people, places, locations, ways of life, etc., there is a transition between the two. It doesn't go, one gone, here you go. This one has to break down as this one emerges. It's a, it's a, a process of uh, one losing power over your reality, another one gaining power. It can happen very quickly, um, but it's not like instant. That's actually a great metaphor for what's going in the macrocosm. Exactly. Exactly. And, and in the United States in particular, but certainly England, you know, all over. I mean, well, we can see it here. I mean, what's happening here with the economic, you know, downturn and with people losing their houses, you know, their shells, if you will, change their lives. If I, they I, go, I couldn't agree more. And the more you resist, I think, the more destruction is going to happen. The less you resist, the quicker... You know, the destructive phase is over and you can actually start climbing back up. Exactly. In your case, you were quite extraordinary in the sense that you had this radical change in your life. Almost, you know, you went from you know, black to white. Almost, there was almost no downtime for you, it sounds like. Although you said for three months. Three months was the was big on. downtime. But that's extraordinarily quick, you know, especially in the 90s. Today... I think this is happening to people and they are going through a, a quicker transition and in some ways there's also a reason for that because you and people like you have made it easier for those that are following now to, to go through the changes. I hope so. Through a, a veil. 
I hope so. I mean, that's, that's, I, I get such satisfaction when, 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 when people say that they were helped in understanding what was going on. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I talk about this a lot now because between that, the old self, and all that it projects in what we call the physical experience and the new self, which projects something else, there is apparent chaos relationships break down, you lose your job, you can lose your house and, and all this stuff. And, and if you live that as a physical, I am a human body experience, then it's very, very challenging. If you start, if you see, look, this is where I want to go and you realize that this is the transition to get there, then you can encompass the um, unpleasant experiences as just that, an experience um, which you're going through to get to somewhere. And quite right, I, uh, the collective, there's so many levels of this, you know. It's like when people say to me sometimes, you know, well, tell me what's going on. I say, well, first of all, I'm not the guru, um, but if you want to know what I think is going on, my question is, what level of what's going on do you want to talk about? Because there's so many ways to observe the same thing. So on one level, um, these... Illuminati bloodlines have crashed the global economic system because they want to have that as a problem to which they can offer a solution, which is a fiercely Orwellian fascist centralized um, economic system. Um, but on another level, I would suggest, well beyond their level of comprehension because they're stuck in their own box, otherwise they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Um, we are witnessing the transition from the prison society to the the paradise society, if you like, or the freedom society. And to, to go from the system we've had, which is based on control and imposition, to the system that we're heading towards, which is what this vibrational change is all about, um, w this has got to go. Right. And it's now going. And if people... And it's easy to say this. It's easy to say these apparently tried things when you, you, you know, you've got a, a knock on your door saying you're leaving your house today. Yeah. Um, but if we can hold this level of seeing it, it makes it easier. Um, we're going through this, this process where it, it, it's all breaking down. And if we can encompass it as what it is, which is a collective experience to get to where we, we'd like to go, a world of freedom, a world of kindness, a world of love, a world of um, um, freedom to express your uniqueness rather than be imprisoned in your um, uh, tiny version and false identity of what you are told you are, um, then it's much easier than if you seek to cling to the wreckage of the dying system um, right, and, and, and hold it together. In some ways, you were something of a pioneer, where you had to do it, go it alone. I imagine that you must have, have, have much more support now from everywhere, just in the way that Kerry is describing, than you did when you really felt that you were alone going down the rack. Yeah, uh, it's funny though, Jim, because, um, I mean, there's so many things I like to talk about that you just, you've just yeah. brought up, because I think it's very, very important. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a loner. But my connection has always been to that which is driving me and opening doors and pushing me in this direction. And I just follow that. So although I, I was alone in so many ways when it all happened, I, I, I still had that connection. And, and I still have that connection now. And, and people are, so, are very kind um, and, and very supportive. Um, but I still, I still basically just operate in my own little bubble and just go my own way. I, I don't deal with organizations. I don't connect with other researchers or anything like that. I just follow this impulse. Um, but it is easier because there's more people that are, are open to what you're saying. But, you know, what you just brought up uh, is, is very, very important. And, you know, for me, if, if not the greatest human disease of all, because everything comes out of it, I guess, is insecurity. Um, ironically, it was at the height of mass national ridicule that I found my security. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's that, that line in that song, I think it was in the 60s, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. 
And you have to look inside of your security. You're not going to get it from anywhere else. Outside. Yeah, I mean, you look at my situation in regard to that line from that song in um, the early 90s, early mid 90s. Um, I was being ridiculed by a nation. So I had nothing left to lose. Um, and that's when I found freedom. The freedom uh, to break out of the prisons of fearing what other people think. And basically, I was, you laugh, laugh, but this is me. You know, I saw a great um, I car sticker. Free. I remember a great car sticker in California, I saw, would be in California. And it said, uh, you laugh at me because I'm different, I laugh at you because you're all the same. <laughs> and, and I don't laugh at people because they're all the same, but you, 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 it, it, it is ironic when, you, when this, 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 this herd mentality is kind of focusing on one person as it was in Britain at that time. And you, and you look at them and you think, you're laughing at me? <laughs> My God. Um, and so f this economic thing that's going, and you know, I've been describing it recently and as like a, like a controlled demolition of a building. You see the charges go off, and then there's a bizarre split second before the building goes, um, and then it collapses. Well, in the economic terms uh, of this crash, we are in that bizarre split second now. I've been uh, describing the economic uh, situation we're in recently as like a controlled demolition where you see the charges go off and you know there's a problem. But then there's a bizarre split second before the building actually crashes. And I would say that we are in and getting very, very closer to the edge of by the day, that bizarre split second. We've seen nothing yet. I mean, this is a crash that no one alive today will, um, will have seen. Um, uh, it can be compared with the 1930s, but because of the way the world is and there's more people and mm. the nature of home ownership and all the rest of it, it's going, I think it's going to be um, uh, bigger. Fewer so, people with gardens and independent means of doing anything at all with, were much more interconnected. That's the idea. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. And, and so we, we now face this very situation you're talking about where we need to reevaluate our and it would have been a good idea to do it anyway, <laughs> our symbols of success. Right. Now, because um, insecurity is rampant in people and society, both individually, collectively, and on the level of governments and media and all the rest of it, are constantly getting people to feel insecure, um, most people do not get their sense of who they are from in here. They get it from what they think is out there, so it's in their heads. Absolutely. And therefore, if you are going to attract to you the recognition you want that you're an okay person to feed your insecurity, you have to succeed out there on the basis of the symbols of success that out there recognizes as success. And of course, through the media and the indoctrination from Cradle to Grave, it's more money, bigger house, bigger mm. car, fame, all this stuff, mm. titles and all this business. He who dies with the most toys wins. Yeah, so what you've got is the insecurity itself is to um, kind of feed some acknowledgement that to uh, lessen its insecurity. It's chasing these symbols of success that society has decided is successful. And we forget other symbols of success. Am I happy? Am I fulfilled? You know, um, do I live in a, in a, in a society, a kind, uh, loving society that I'd like to live in? And all this goes by the board because the other thing about needing to succeed on this manufactured basis to feed this is that you then have to compete with all the other people that are trying to succeed in the same way to feed their insecurity. Right. And that, that creates this dog-eat-dog, -dog, uh, top-of-the-greasy-pole society where everyone's walking over everyone else. Well, not everyone, but vast numbers of people are walking over everyone else so that they're the ones on the top of the pile that get their insecurity fed most profoundly with the symbols of success. Uh, and this is why this insecurity is why you find some of the most insecure people you'll ever meet in places like Hollywood and in the entertainment industry, because their insecurity is such, and they're not all like this, some very secure people who just play music and like to act, but there's a lot of insecure people because they, they need that extra adulation to feed their insecurity. Um, and so if we can move our point of observation from I am this body that I see in the mirror in the morning, I am David Icke, I am Charlie Smith, Ethel Jones, whatever, to I am consciousness having an experience. 
then um, your values of what is successful change because your point of observation of, of, of everything changes. And it's the mind um, working through the body that deals in um, status and symbols of success that are uh, how, pie, uh, how high is your pile of trinkets. Uh, whereas consciousness it doesn't deal in trinkets, it, it knows they're illusory. Um, and, and of course, when you deal in trinkets like that, it's the trinkets controlling you, you're not controlling the trinkets. Of course. Um, and, and so, for me, the whole foundation, both of coming through this crash to something much better as a result of it, and the whole transformation in general, is moving out of mind and into what I call consciousness, which is that beyond this virtual reality game, beyond this biological computer we call the body. And you can start to see the difference because mind deals in structure, it deals in hierarchy, um, and it deals in a partness, mm. sees everything as a part. And polarization. Yeah, and, and um, if, if that's what you are, um, if that's the way you're seeing life, in terms of hierarchical structures and a partners and competition and all this stuff, you're in mind. Ironically, the religions are in mind and all, they're all mind constructs, they're religions, that's why they have rules and regulations. That's another uh, massive red light. Hey, mind, and that's rules and regulations and laws. And limitation. Limitation, sense of limitation. So if we can, if we can change our point of observation, so we cease to see ourselves uh, vitally and uh, the world we think we're living in um, in those terms and l look at it from a point of view of consciousness. I said earlier that um, this, this force that's been kind of pushing me through my last 20 years took me through synchronistic um, experiences to understand a five sense level of the conspiracy, then moved into the interdimensional connection and the reptilian connection to these families. And since 2003, it's taken me into what I, I know is the, by far the most important, and that is understanding the nature of reality. Because, you know, how can you uh, get a grasp of your own life and take any kind of control of your own experience if you don't know who you are, where you are, or the nature of the world you're living in. And this information for me is by far the most important because it moves the point of experience from in this world to observing this world, uh, or a mixture of the two. And that, when, if you're in this world and, and you're of this world, then what's coming is going to be a bloody nightmare if you become the observer as well as the experiencer by becoming more conscious then it's much easier because that's not you that's your experience which you're observing and absolutely um this is something that george green says what he was in contact with the playarans and that they were they helped you know write a book through him that says that exact thing that you need to stay in the observer mode exactly and observe what's going on and not get caught up in the experience in such a way that it that actually as you say you become of this world instead of in it but not of it yeah and and what i found as i'm talking more and more about the reality we live in um is it does if you like um, take the edge off um the fear of what's happening because it is funny really um, I, 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 I think that when we find out everything that's going on and the nature of what we're experiencing and what's behind it, I think we're going to laugh for weeks. I do. I think we're going to laugh for weeks. And we thought it was that? Oh my God. Um, and the whole thrust of the maze and opening and closing doors since 19, 2003 for me, and it's getting more and more deep and deep and deeper, is what is reality, who are we, what we're doing here, and how do we interact with it. And it's very clear to me that this is a virtual reality uh, universe of enormous advancement compared with what we perceive to be virtual reality simulations in, in this world. And you know, this is not just 
supposition. This is provable yeah. scientific fact. I mean, it's so good that we think it's real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, um, the five senses just decode vibrational information into electrical signals, send it to the brain, and the brain decodes it into this construct that we think is outside there, but it's actually inside us. The only place this world exists, a, so a so-called solid world, a three-dimensional world, is out there. Is uh, out there, we think. But actually, it doesn't exist out there. Out there is just vibrational mm -hmm. fields. It exists in here as we construct it. Um, and even the brain is a, is a decoded construct the, uh, uh, as well. It's, it's on, on an energetic level that we do the decoding, really. Um, and this is very, very important because what the manipulator, manipulators do, because they've hoarded this basic knowledge and passed it over at the highest level of the secret society network That's and right. sucked yep. it out of public circulation, yep. they know that if we look out there for answers, believing that there is an out there, instead of an illusory, project, illusory projection that's going on in here, then we're never going to change anything. Yeah. Never going to change anything. And uh, once you go, ah, there's no out there, so where's it coming from? Oh, it's coming from in here, so this is where I have to change. Oh, there you go. It's what I call, um, and this is what most people do, because of the suppression of this understanding, is they stand in the movie theater and they shout at the screen because they don't like the movie. Uh -huh. And people say, you're crazy, you're never going to change the movie, shout at the screen, go back to the projection room, change the reel if you don't like the movie. And the, the projection is deep within us, you know. The, some research I saw recently says that uh, about f only 5% of behavior and decisions that we make are with the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. I would actually, I would say that's not correct, personally. I'd say 100% of what happens in this three-dimensional reality, it's only in our head, actually is a projection. And the mm -hmm. con conscious mind mm -hmm. is actually not the decision maker mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. It's the observer and experiencer of it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's like, it literally is the same principle as a, a movie um, projector which comes from within, within what we call the subconscious, where all those patterns are there which we're being influenced by and are, are affecting our projection and our reading of it. And it comes out of the subconscious. And by the time it hits the screen in here, symbolically on the movie theater, it's a done deal. This is where the change has to take place within us to change the projection, which is our conscious mind's experience. And people are so caught in the conscious mind as, as that's the only level. I mean, they hear talk about subconscious and all that stuff, but really, it's, I, I thought it. Well, how come that experiments have shown that um, the electrical changes and muscular changes um, to make an action happen um, are, happen a split second before the conscious mind has decided to do it? It's because they're playing it out. And so th this talk about we must go within, you know, this new age must go within. Um, uh, and, and there's much about the new age I would challenge, but uh, this basic uh, theme is absolutely right, I would say. Um, and what the whole conspiracy is trying to do is get us to look out there. Let's go and protest, let's go and do this, let's go and do that. And you protest and you have a million people on the streets of London protesting against war. And what happens? The war goes on and then they start another bugger. And it's just more dialectic. Yeah, we... Yep need to change the projection mm. um, and well the this is um, actually something that we've come around to and we're you know we're aware that consciousness is where the change has to happen and then consciousness is actually also where you have to apply the change in your vision of reality you can't actually just stop there it actually has to permeate everything so it needs to be embodied in this body, but we have to talk about who's in control. So if consciousness is in control, and I can use this to do, for example, what we're doing here, which can be used to further change and push the change and help the change, then, then this is a good thing. But it's not enough, in other words, just to go in like Buddha and simply sit in your mind and do nothing. Because doing nothing is also not the answer. We actually came here with a purpose, 
a game is being played out here. And as you, if you stay in both consciousness and you're able to, to change your inner self and then mirror it outside and facilitate, which is what you're doing, obviously. And obviously you, you, you embody this in your life. And, and what we've been doing with Camelot is we're also talking about, you can't actually demonstrate in the streets and get real results. Because it's it's really you know action reaction. Exactly. It's really that. I agree. But but you can join minds and meditate. There are places for action that are actually really proactive and can change the world in a positive way. So it's it's kind of it's it's a very interesting you know dilemma for people that they have to actually embody the change that they see and live it that's that's I, you know you cannot be a contradiction to what's inside it, it doesn't work there has to be a through line well i would I, I would put it i would put it this way i would say that um as i mentioned a few minutes ago that this reality uh, this holographic illusory physical construct which we put together in our heads and it's like a holographic internet i call it that is 100 percent a projection and by the time it hits this screen it's a done deal mm -hmm. uh, in our experience but a lot of people i come across and heard they do um, think that if you just sit and meditate or just go within then that's all you need to do but this is a projection and it's a projection from somewhere so this projection is a, um, an open book of the inner us individually and collectively. So what we play out in this experience says everything about our state of being. And, and you, can, you can say go within and you can use it as an excuse to not go without. And you could go within, always I go within and I meditate. Okay, so what are you, what's happening in the projection as a result of what you're doing? The only projection uh, that you're affecting is you sitting cross-legged in the corner. Mm -hmm. What else is changing? Yes, of course, you can change things vibrationally to, to an extent. But, you know, what is happening in the world is saying what's happening in us and we kind of miss that connection so if we're doing nothing to um, make a contribution to the kind of world we like to live in then it uh, in the in the physical world then that says something about the state of us within that we're not doing that um, and uh, there's I see so many um, excuses being made by people who have become to a certain extent aware of some of what's going on so that they can justify to themselves why they're doing nothing. People say to me, you don't tell us what to do. And I think, well, actually, I, I talk about becoming conscious and all that stuff. I think, you know, that's a start. But it ain't for me to tell you what to do. Exactly. And if you think that, that I have to tell you what to do, then you're not listening because this is about taking power back to the point where we project, rather than looking out here uh, at a done deal. Absolutely. But there's an active, active paradox here, isn't there? Because that's not the whole story, otherwise you'd be sitting in the corner smiling and not talking to us here, and not working as hard as you do, and not talking to people to, to help the process of waking them up so that they can then join you in this understanding, which we share with you also. It's important in a sense, to pretend that all this is real, because this is the platform from which we can waken ourselves up and rejoin consciousness again. And so it's a paradox. It goes on at both levels. What you say is true, and this all is an illusion, and it all doesn't matter, but it's all important enough for us to be talking about it. What I was saying is in your presentation, where you're talking about consciousness and the mind and, and the problems with staying just in mind, because there's a lot of brilliant people out there, coming to brilliant conclusions, and yet they can't live it. See, the manifestation doesn't go anywhere. 
yeah, it becomes, it becomes an intellectual, um, academic kind of point of observation rather than consciousness, which is something that uh, just is. Um, and uh, the, 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 the difference that I am now increasingly making is between mind and consciousness. And I would go further and say that we talk about my mind, your mind, his mind, her mind. I, I, I don't see it like that. I say, I talk about the mind. There is a, a the mind is a construct of the virtual reality universe, which allows us consciousness to inter, interconnect um, with this virtual reality. It's like um, a conduit. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Um, if it serves the experience of consciousness and serves our ability to interact with this virtual reality um, uh, universe. What has happened, and I would strongly suggest it's been manipulated to happen, um, not least by these families and other levels of the manipulation, is we have been manipulated into a, a, a false identity which is identifying who we are with mind, which operates immediately, uh, directly through the body and calls itself David Icke, Ethel Jones, Charlie Smith, uh, looks in the mirror and thinks that's who it is. And basically, um, you know, this is a biological computer. It, it's not a, a computer that just reacts to the way it's programmed to react to data input. It has the ability to, um, they call them living computers, uh, biological computers. They're try, try, trying to build them now, so different parts of the world. Mm. It has the ability to assess information and make decisions on it. In other words, to, to, to quite a large extent, it has the ability to think. And what happens is, if we get caught in mind and self-identity of that reflection in the mirror is me, um, then, and not just my experience, then mind starts to govern our sense of reality. And mind is about division, apartness, hierarchy, rules, regulations, laws, limitation. Um, and, you know, you can have someone in the New Age arena who talks about spirituality, talks about other dimensions, and which are other virtual reality games, I would suggest, um, other levels, but blatantly is stuck in mind and the values of mind. I mean, I, I, I hear New Age people talk about the great white brotherhood and the hierarchy of the, of the angels and the stuff. Mm -hmm. That's mind talking. Question. Consciousness doesn't yep. do hierarchy. Exactly. Mm. It just mm. is all possibility, all all that is. Yep. And so the same mind construct, the mind, um, can can entrap a new ager as it entraps in another part yep. of the mind a Wall Street banker. It's just another religion. It's another yeah, religion. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, I was I was talking to, to I was talking on an interview yesterday, and we got into some interesting areas. Um, he asked me about religion. Well, religion and a political party and the new age and all these things that we don't call religions, institutions, that they're, they're all the same construct. Right. Um, and because consciousness just is. Consciousness doesn't think. Consciousness knows. That's why consciousness is silent when we access it. Because it's got nothing to work out. The mind is where the chatter comes from because it's constantly trying to work things out. What about tomorrow? What about yesterday? What did she say about me? Silence, consciousness. And uh, so to hold you in mind, and this conspiracy is about holding the population in mind because then they got you. Absolutely. Because that's their stadium mind. They're stuck in mind. Um, if they were conscious, they wouldn't do what they're doing. Um, to hold us in mind, they have to sell us something to rigidly believe in. So religion's brilliant example of rigid belief. And what is it? Once you rigidly believe something, you then call it a name. What are you? You don't say, I'm consciousness. How many people say, um, hello, who are you? I'm consciousness. Oh, so am I. Nice to meet you. No, no. What we are is what we do. Oh, I'm a journalist. I work in a factory. Um, uh, what are you? I'm a Hindu. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, these are mind constructs. These are mind prisons that limit our sense of self. So once you have a religious belief, then you give it a name. And I have a simple philosophy about all this. If you, if you can tell me what you believe, 
and give it a name, you're in, you're in a prison. Because everything just is, we all just are. It's the force with no name, I call it, consciousness. And so you create religion, and then after the name, then comes the rules and regulations, this is how the construct goes, of what you have to conform to if you are going to allow, be allowed to call yourself whatever name that's been come up with. You're not a Christian if you believe that and all this stuff. But then you look at political parties. You, you have a, a group of people, they get, they get together and, and they, they want to do something politically. So they give what they're doing a name, Democrats, uh, Republicans, Labour Party, Conservative Party, whatever. So there's the name. Now come the rules and regulations that decide if you can call yourself one of the... You can't believe that and be a conservative. You can't believe that and be a liberal. It's the same construct wherever you look. Yeah. And, and then the, uh, the belief system, as research has shown, rigid beliefs, the, the, the neurons fire off in a certain uh, network um, and uh, sequence in line with the belief, because what the brain's doing is then uh, filtering, decoding reality and circumstance through the belief system, which manifests in the brain is the way the neurons fire off. And suddenly, you, instead of being free thinking, or even better, free knowing, conscious, you are operating in a tiny little box. And that box is basically the way you're, well, not basically, it is the way, your brain decodes reality. Um, and so once you're into belief, um, rigid belief, then they got you. And that's why they want to mm. sell you rigid beliefs. Yeah. But there's an act active paradox here, isn't there? Because that's not the whole story. Otherwise, you'd be sitting in the corner smiling and not talking to us here and not working as hard as you do and not talking to people to, to help the process of waking them up so that they can then join you in this understanding, which we share with you also. It's important, in a sense, to pretend that all this is real, because this is the platform from which we can waken ourselves up and rejoin consciousness again. And so it's a paradox. It goes on at both levels. What you say is true, and this all is an illusion, and it all doesn't matter, but it's all important enough for us to be talking about it. It, matches, I mean? it matches, Jim, in the sense that um, do we want to experience a reality that's very, very unpleasant? Um, and controlling and limiting and frightening and stressful or do we want to experience a reality that is loving kind um, where no one goes hungry in a world of plenty uh, where there is no war because no one would even consider the idea that it was uh, a possibility or an option that's the choice we're making we're always consciousness and when we leave the body uh, we'll become much more at least much more aware of everything that we are now so we're always conscious we're all eternal consciousness but the question is what kind of experience do we want here exactly you know what, yeah. that's the choice what yes. kind of we call it what kind of game do you want to play yeah we have a chance now because we are consciousness to change the rules of the game to make it something different than it is change inside but let's also agree because that's what's happening that's what a consciousness revolution has to be about it's not good enough for you david ike to have got it it's not good enough for us to have got it what we need is for everyone to get it that's in this game here on this plane because that's what it's really about in other words consciousness and this is where it gets into what is consciousness it's love and what is love it's actually the awareness of all of us mm. well I, I would say everything is consciousness um, but mind is consciousness uh, but it's a, a, a much denser um, expression of consciousness and that's why it's these everything in terms of limitation and as people become conscious it can to use the term of a friend of mine in South Africa, it, consciousness can conscientize mind and, and bring its awareness um, out of the level that it currently perceives reality. But I, I do think it's important that we, if we're going to play this game successfully,
that we understand where the game's being played. It's not being played out there. See, what, 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 what the five senses are doing, like I said earlier, is that they're, they're um, decoding vibrational information, turning it into electro signals, and the brain then constructs this apparent reality out there, which is actually only in here. So the prime reality is vibrational. That's the prime reality. That's where the change has to take place. Because as, as the change takes place there, the five senses um, decode different vibrational states into like, electrical signals. Like that wonderful story told by Michael Talbot in the holographic universe. Yeah. And I read that page over and over again when I first saw that book in the late 1980s. This is the story about the stage hypnotist who hypnotized the father to believe that his, father was invi that his daughter was invisible. Mm -hmm. And then he was able to read an inscription on the watch held behind her, his, her, her body because for him it was no longer there and reality had changed. It was physically different in his mind. Well, this is the whole point, you see, that um, for a hypnotist to put a, a watch behind someone's back and, and someone on the other side of a read it, that, that is perceived to be impossible. But it, it's only impossible if you believe this world to be solid and real and out there. Um, the reason it could happen is because um, the, the prime reality, and this, I can't emphasize this more, uh, more, the prime reality that is playing out here is vibrational. That has to change or this can't change. And, and so if um, the hypnotist, as he did, um, implanted the program into the guy's brain not to decode the vibrational level, the prime level of his daughter through this system into a holographic uh, so-called physical form that we see, then he would decode the, all the other vibrational fields in the room into people and walls and furniture. But because it's like a computer being firewalled off, he doesn't decode the daughter's prime state, your prime state, our prime state, the prime state of everything, this vibration, the vibrational level, into the holographic, apparently out there reality. And so she doesn't exist in his, in his head as a holographic form, i.e. supposedly physical, so he can't see her. Because she's not there, he can see what's behind her. It's, it, and therefore, he can read a watch, even though she's standing there, to everyone else in the room. They can see her. Why? Because their brain has not been programmed not to read that energy field into a holographic form. Now, just as a quick aside, how many things collectively are we not reading hmm. that are there to be read? Yeah. Um, right. well, one of the things is there's more than five senses. Okay, and the heart is, you, you can't, see, it's not just the mind, it's actually the heart. It's really the heart and the intelligence of the heart that he could see through if he would only use that. So it's, it's more than, we have, in other words, this, these are tools for us. Our mind is a tool, our heart is a tool, but you can't stay up here. You've actually got to go through the heart to really see. See, we don't see with our eyes. That's actually, that's a construct. That, yeah, that's we, a we mental see with our brain, construct. Yeah. We actually see with our heart more than anything else <laughs> and through the heart. And so what happens is it's a, it's a union between the mind and the heart. Yeah, I agree. That allows you to see. And what you could put yourself in that man's position and say, how could the man see through the implant in his, in, that was put into his brain? First of all, what did he do? He had to accept the magicians or, you know, implant to begin with. So in the same way, we in society mm. are accepting the implant, whether it's television or whatever, which is blocking our real view of reality. We're accepting it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, though, that what the, what the hypnotist was doing was just programming the decoding mechanism. Yes. Uh, and therefore, he didn't decode uh, a, a vibrational field, i.e. his daughter, into a holographic form. Therefore, he didn't yeah. see her. And I completely agree um, that the heart has the potential to be a massive part of um, our reality, um, uh, decoding our reality expression. But we also have to appreciate that this conspiracy, uh, while we see the George Bushes of the world and the Barack Obamas and people like that and the Kissingers, the real level of this conspiracy where the world is being controlled is on a vibrational level. That's why I talk about these reptilians that are doing this and, and, and others too, operating outside this 
reality. They operate in the level of the vibrational level. That's where that's where the manipulation's going, and we need to be, yep. you know, kind to ourselves as well in in understanding the the challenges that we've faced, and not least trying to understand a world that is being manipulated into a, a state or has been manipulated into a state which is to stop us understanding the world. Um, and so, you know, we look at television and uh, the manipulation of, of television and newspapers and stuff. But that, when we see a newspaper or we see a television program, we're just seeing the decoded version of a vibrational field. Those newspapers and, and, and those um, television programs and news programs and all the rest of it, they are actually, quote, physical yes. holographic representations mm. of the prime reality, which is yep. a vibrational field. It's at that level yes. that that manipulation we call subliminal, that ma manipulation we call um, uh, lying to the people and all the rest of it, um, actually happens. And, and so basically what they've done is pull a vibrational veil um, um, over us. Um, and if you can make it uh, powerful enough and dense enough, you uh, focus people's um, sense of perception into such a narrow area mm. that they disconnect from an awareness and therefore a deep uh, effect in their perception of consciousness. You're mm. isolating their point of observation into mind and mm. that's happening on a vibrational level which then plays out in what we call the physical yes. world so it's uh, it's it's in, it, what's vital and this is why this information is so important not just I tell you what I have found um, nothing represents uh, literally literally and symbolically the, the, the prison uh, than the left brain which deals in um, a partner's language, uh, hierarchy, structure, and all this stuff. Um, and the information about the five sense conspiracy, I've found, uh, one of its great values is that it operates in a left brain realm when you're explaining how this. Uh, and that and the other is connected to the same people and they control that and this is what they're doing and these are the techniques they use that's left brain information right. and when people say mm. oh you shouldn't put out that information it's negative they don't understand mm. that we're looking at a multi-level situation therefore mm. we have to deal with it on a multi-level basis that means mm. covering all bases not mm. just sitting cross-legged on a mountain of course now Yes. What I've found over the years um, is that once the left brain, because uh, symbolically I see, you know, you've got the left brain, which is what I'm talking about. You've got the right brain, which is a much more out there connection and, and sees everything in unity, the creativity. And then you've got the bridge, the corpus callosum, which ideally should be sharing information. So you've got a balance. You're in this world and, 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 and of it, you know. Um, but what the conspiracy does again it's all on a vibrational level that it goes in and then it plays out here is they put symbolically soldiers on the gut on the door to the left brain uh, this is why to progress within this uh, society um, uh, one of the most effective ways is to keep passing exams and passing exams and getting degrees and all this stuff because that's uh, an exam is here's some left brain information now give it me back on a, on a paper telling me what I've told you to believe okay you've done it very well you, you've got a first class degree a first class indoctrination often. Now what this conspiracy information on a five sense level does, it talks to the left brain in the language the left brain understands. And I've seen it over the time in my personal experience, and of course other people would have seen it. It starts to make the left brain change its sense of reality. And once it starts to uh, change that, it starts to think well, hold on a second. If everything I thought about the world here was, was wrong, and it's not like that at all, what the heck else is in this world is not like it, I mm. thought it was. And I've seen this um, where people, once that left brain starts this process of withdrawing from a sense of it knows what's going on to, I never knew, 
then it starts to move. And as it starts to move, it literally starts to open to other possibility. And then this movement between the hemispheres can start to happen. And I've seen people who would have laughed in my face about reality and all that stuff, who now encompass it because they went through the process of, of credible names, dates, places, five cents information, explaining logically why the world is not like they thought it was on a five cents level. Everything starts to move then. Mm. So, so, you know, it's important that um, the deprogramming of people's manipulated sense of reality happens on multi levels, not just yeah. kind of, you know, we must become spiritual, we must go, we must go within. You know, I mean, people, people say, oh, Alex Jones, he just frightens people and all that. Well, hold on a second. You know, just, just hold on a second. You know what, what's negative? It's not information. It's ignorance. That's what's negative. Ignorance. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you want to be ignorant and therefore a manipulator's party trick, then you go ahead. And if you want to look at the information, the five cents information that I put out and Alex puts out and people like that and many others and say it's negative, it's frightening. Well, the fact that you find it frightening instead of empowering because you now yeah. understand the game better and therefore you have more power to do something about it, then that is not a statement about those putting the information out. It's a statement about the way you're receiving it. Exactly. Something that we liked very much was something that George Green said to us in our interview uh, with us April last year. And he used the little analogy. He said, listen, if your car is on the railroad track and there's a train coming down and you don't know that, then, and I don't tell you, then he said, shame on me for not telling you, and shame on you for not knowing. And this is just a nice little way of encapsulating what, what you're saying. Yeah, I, I have, um, I, I have a, an analogy I use very similar to that. I, I, I talk about the, um, uh, the, not the hurricane coming, what, what do you call them, the, the twisters? The tornado. The tornado, yeah. Um, and the tornado's coming, but you have put your head in a bucket of sand because you don't want to face the fact that a tornado is coming. Mm. Um, now, you can hide that from that for a while, but you're still there and the tornado is still coming. Um, and your bum is still in the air mm. and it's going to get smacked very shortly by a tornado. If you lift your head from the sand, face the situation that yeah. you're in, there's a tornado coming, now you, you have taken power back to yourself by saying, okay, I see the situation now. Mm. I can take avoiding action mm. um, for my benefit. Of course. And this is why it's so important. And I, you know, I, you know I, I, hear, I hear people in, 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 who you might call new age who talk about letting go of fear and, and taking your power back and come to this workshop and we'll show you how to do it. And then they say, oh, you mustn't talk about this conspiracy, it's too negative. And these what, happened the, to, mm. what happened to letting go of fear and all this stuff, yeah. you know? And, and what and These are the does, guys who hope that the angel Gabriel is going to come and save us. You know? yeah, well, that doesn't work either. Every level, mm. it seems to me every belief system, every mm. mind construct seems mm. to have a, a version of the cavalry coming over the horizon. Mm. You know, okay, here's the cavalry, okay. Here's the cavalry, here's the cavalry, there's the cavalry. Um, and, and we need to understand that, you know, because uh, if, we, if we give our power away to other people, where do those other people actually, um, where do they actually stand physically as we give their pa our power away to them? Out there, symbolically. Mm. So what we do is giving our power away into the illusion and, and then wondering why nothing ever changes. Um, the whole conspiracy or the foundation of the conspiracy is to persuade six billion people to give their power away every day. And the power used to control mm -hmm. us is the, is the power these people are saying, thank you very much, thank you very much, thank you very much. Take it yeah. back, house of cards comes down, because that's what it is. It's a house of cards and we're holding it together in here. We're constructing the house of cards in here. Great news, we can bring it down mm -hmm. in here. Right, but, but, but I have to say that we're not only going to do that with the mind. That's, that's what's really important here. Now the mind plays, words, it, mind plays it out. We're going to do it by becoming conscious. That's the point. Absolutely. But also left brain, right brain. I want to address that a little right. bit because it's not enough to reconstruct reality based on saying, getting to a place where you don't know and then you're willing to open to a new construction of reality such that you're going to play the, di the game different. 
but you're still lodged in the left brain. You must bring in the holistic view, the view that encompasses the heart, that encompasses the female, which is the yin-yang side of things, because what we have here ha has been playing out for centuries is, is a really yang view of reality, especially on the Western side of, well, kind of, of. the world. I, I and so slightly. what I have to say is, it's more than just reconstructing the left brain in a new way to play the game better, because that's actually cheating yourself on another level. So well, that, what you need is you need to grow and open the door between the left and the right brain such that there is a flow. And that, mm. that means that you're talking about the heart, you're talking about senses that are beyond the five. And so you have to, what you had to do in your own exploration was you never would have gotten the information you wanted to get by staying in the left brain. It actually, as you said, you had physical sensations, they locked your feet, they gave you information that came out of nowhere. You couldn't make logical sense of it. It was logic goes out the window. So left brain's gone. You know, it, even words are, 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 are useless when you get into that place. So it's, it's you must actually, it's like traveling in a sense. You must actually travel to a different place. What you do is you follow your intuition. Right. You're, you're over on your... I, I guess they call it the right side of the brain. That's where you are. That's where intuition resides. So you've opened that door. There is a flow, and, and that's, that's really what has to happen. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I, um, I take my intuition, which has guided me and has led me to information, and also it's like a, it's like a filter. I have a... I have a a, a vibrational sensation when something is not true and something is true and another one when it's maybe partly true. That's holistic. Yeah, but I still, the, the left brain is still important on bringing those concepts down into uh, a, a language of communication that, will, that, that people can assimilate that are, that, that are stuck in the left brain because if you don't talk in logical, from their perspective, logical um, uh, terms, that the left brain can understand, which is which is under lock and key, then that 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 uh, key will never open, and that that is also why what you've just said, that you will, um, except on rare occasions when I'm talking in a very small time scale or doing an interview on a specific subject, I will never talk about the five sense conspiracy without the nature of reality and the influence of and the and the the um, influence of consciousness and the all the rest of it. Um, another point you make is about the heart. I agree. The heart is uh, absolutely at the heart of this and is much more powerful than the brain, much more powerful than the mind, because it is connected, I would say, that what connects us through to consciousness. And this conspiracy also, because, you know, it's, it's a simple thing. In the deep shadows behind the people in dark suits um, are a force, whatever you want to call it, that understands how this works. Right. So they've structured a society that is to close down all the channels to consciousness, to I isolate us in mind, because yeah. then we're playing in their stadium. And one of the key things that is to close the heart, to close the heart. Mm -hmm. And if you want to open the heart and you want to become conscious, it's what I say in my talks, then what we need to do is to ask the question, what would consciousness do in this po at this point? Would consciousness, when we face with these set of circumstances, say, well, what's the best outcome for me? No, consciousness will say, what is right, just, fair thing in this situation for me to do? And if we, um, when we face with choices all through the day, um, ask that question in this circumstance, what would consciousness do? And act upon it, crucially, um, then, then everything changes. And our life changes. Why? Because yes. we are now starting to resonate with consciousness because we're operating in its realm, um, which is by, by doing what, what we say consciousness would do in these circumstances, we are vibrationally locking in to that level and therefore becoming more and more influenced by consciousness. When we say, well, yeah, well, I never see that, but I mean, what, it's not good for me if I do what's right in the situation. I'm, I must do what's right for me. That's, that's mind, so that's locking you into mind. 
Um, uh, you know, th this thing about becoming conscious, I, I see it um, so often uh, all over the world. I mean, I was in India just before Christmas and, you know, good luck to them, but they make it sound so complicated. And, and, you know, a lot of the complication, I see this with new age people that, that stand on stages and do workshops, not all of them, of course, but I see it with gurus in India and stuff like that. Not all of them, again, but vast numbers of them. The complexity says two things. One, they don't really understand it, because if, if you really understand something, you can put it in simple language. I'd agree with This that. is why you get academia repeating jargon, and you say, look, I'm an idiot, mate, okay? I never passed an exam in my life. I left school at 15 to be a professional soccer player. You're going to have to put it in language I can understand. They can't, because they don't really understand it. There's repeating jargon. And the other side of the complexity of becoming conscious is if you can make it sound complex, then you've taken power over your potential audience. Absolutely. That's a it's big so thing. Of course. I, 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 you have to come through me, and the more I, more I make it sound complex, the more power I have, and therefore the more you must come to me, and the longer you must stay with me. And oh, by the way, you know, put the check in the, in the, in the box as you leave. Um, and yet it is so simple. This is the point I would make. People talk about um, we must become conscious. It's, it's a line. We are conscious. That is our natural state. Mm. What's happened is um, barriers that we have been manipulated, and we, you know, we must take responsibility for it too, big time, have put in place, have symbolically created a concrete uh, shell um, around our natural state. Mm. And this concrete shell are all the things that control people, fear and stress and conflict and seeking success and competition and all this stuff. Um, it's not that we have to become conscious. We are conscious. It's, it's like breaking that shell, and that shell is mind domination. <clears throat> it's like we the break lie that that's shell, in language. Like, like the lie that's in language when people say, "My spirit, my soul, and I'm hungry." It's like, wait a minute, this is the wrong way around here. You know, I have a body, and my body is hungry, and my body is tired, and I am a soul, and I am a spirit. But language, yeah. which is a product of the mind in the first place, because we don't think uh, how, we don't talk how we think, we think how we talk. And language is one of the ways in which we're programmed to well, think. Massive it. way. Massive, massive. As George Orwell massive, pointed out in 1984. Programming the computer. Yeah. But what are words? They're vibrational uh, fields. Mm. So again, even the words that programmers are actually coming in at a vibrational level, yeah. a waveform level, and they're only decoded into language when they pass through the, 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 the brain construct. Yeah. So everything goes, gets in, that plays out here, gets in at a vibrational uh, level. That's why we need to get to that level of ourselves and clear ourselves out, because that's where all the, all the patterns um, 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 are put in. And I use this analogy in my, in my talks that, um, you know, um, a, a, a ball, its natural place in a tank of water is on the top, just floating away. The natural state, free, going like, mm. if you want to put the ball in a natural state in the tank, you've got to put it on the, on the, the bottom of the tank and you've got to hold it there. You, you can't put it there and it'll stay there because it's not its natural state. Its natural state is floating on the top and natural state is being conscious. So what the manipulation has had to do is, and this, is, this is a, says something about the true scale of who we are, it has had to bombard us with so many multi-level um, uh, systems of control, diversion, and manufactured ignorance to symbolically hold mm. the ball on the bottom. And it That's hasn't actually, succeeded with... Mounting. Say again? This is their mounting. Yeah. These systems of control. That's what the move towards you know, a fascist state and a, and a world government is all about. I, um, I actually heard an interview with you in which you talked about that fact. The fact that, you see, the fact that we are, if you sent, if you, you, to use your analogy, which is a very good one, to, we are consciousness, and as that ball, we are moving as a group towards the surface of the water. We're actually getting out of their grasp. Right. As that happens, they're intensifying their game to want to keep that ball down. And so that's why the stakes are rising on both sides. Couldn't agree more. And what's going to happen is, look at the natural, I mean, even the metaphor is perfect. Because what's going to happen ultimately? The water 
and the ball are going to win. Okay? There's no way that those forces, as much as they intensify, sometime, somewhere, that ball is going to get to the surface. Like it or not, the yeah. powers that be. Now, what's going to be interesting is if they actually start understanding on a deeper level than power and their power over because I've got the clue and I've got the key. That's what the Illuminati, you know, that's what they think. They think if you don't get it, then you can, we can hold you down. You deserve to be held down. That's actually their, I'm sure you know this, this is their rationale. So what happens is, what happens when we, because we're greater than their, our body, you know, our, the consciousness that we are is greater than what they are, because they're on limitation, starts to win in their own mind, you see, and they start to let go. Because this is what's, what's probably happening. There have to be many members that have been under the thumb of this game and have joined and are being, you know, we're being patted on the head and given all the reinforcement necessary to keep them in the game. What happens when they start to see the light, so to speak? And, and some of them, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, already are, um, because there's nothing more fiercely compartmentalized than this whole control structure itself. Um, it, it, there's so many people uh, within the control structure, right down into mainstream society, that are daily contributing to this uh, gathering fascist global state who, who have no idea of the true implications of it, or uh, as they go up higher and higher, have been misled about the nature of themselves, reality, and the force behind it. So the nature of the chaos and the destruction will actually work in the favor of releasing the ball, because what yeah. happens is during chaos, you can change sides, you see. You can actually, you know, it's really hard to maintain control during a time of destruction. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, what I would say is that the ball will get to the top of the water when the ball realizes it is the water. Um, and <laughs> and um, the scale of the, um, the movement and the speed of movement of this uh, conspiracy now, as it puts in more and more surveillance, more and more control, more and more centralization of power, etc. I've been saying for years now, that is not about even gathering more power. It is about defending the control that's already there. Because they understand. I mean, if, if I can go to a psychic in, um, in England in 1990 to be told through this uh, psychic that this vibrational change was coming and it was going to create a spiritual revolution. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, are the, are the Illuminati families not going to know that this spiritual change, this vibrational alarm clock is coming. I mean, of course they are. And they've known about it for a long time. And so what, um, what we're looking at is um, a, I mean, you, when you move, move the power from we're controlling, we're going to give more power to um, we must impose more and more control to stop this happening. They're, they're not in a, uh, if you like, a proactive situation now as they push this Orwellian state on, they're in a defensive situation trying to keep the mm. lid on human ignorance yes. as this vibrational change yeah. brings it to the surface. And, you know, compared with consciousness, this Illuminati, I mean, there flies on an elephant's back, you know, um, and they're going to get uh, removed. And, you know, I, I, I think if, it's not about winning the game, it's not about losing the game. It's about realizing the nature of the game and the fact that it's not about winning and losing, it's just about experiencing. And, and as these pyramids of control, certainly the lower levels first, start getting picked off by this vibrational change and people start to see things differently. You know, as I've been saying for 20 years, you know, look at a pyramid. Hmm. You know, the capstone's the place of the power. No, it's not. The capstone's up there because the rest of the pyramid's over in the bugger up there. The rest of the pyramid moves away. Where's the capstone going to do? It's going to crash to the floor. There's nothing holding it up. We're holding up um, the structure that is our own um, uh, control system. And I, I, I used to tell a story years ago. You'll remember, Jim. Larry Grayson, the comedian in England, yes. right? 
And I, I'm, I, I knew Larry towards the end of his life. He used to do big shows on the BBC. And I was invited to his, um, his um, memorial service at uh, Covent Garden after he died. And there's another comedian in Britain called Roy Hudd. And he did this presentation uh, to, about uh, Larry's life. And he told this story and I sat there and I thought, whoa, that is, that is so profound <laughs> when applied to what we're talking about. He t he, it, Roy Hudd said that uh, Larry Grayson had told him this story that uh, in the, uh, the days of the music hall type theatre or the last vestiges of it, Larry was in an all-male show going around uh, Britain. And he was the woman in it, because he used to dress up as a woman, Larry. And the, the final scene of the show, the final part of the show, was um, all the men ran on the stage dressed as sailors, singing Rule Britannia, you know. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves and all that stuff. You're not Britain. I was to rule everything. Anyway, um, so as the song's reaching its climax, all these sailors climb on each other's backs and form a pyramid on the stage, right? Mm. And then Larry Grayson came on, dressed as Britannia with the gown and the helmet and the sword, and was manhandled up the, to the top of the pyramid of these men, you know, with the, the big finish with the sword. And um, he said one night, Things seemed to be going rather well, he said, until one of the sailors in the bottom left-hand corner got a cough, right? And the cough got worse and worse and worse until he couldn't stay, hold his place in the pyramid anymore. And he's standing on the stage at the bottom of the pyramid, this guy, you know, Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith. And in the end, he couldn't hold it anymore because the cough got too bad. And he, 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 he had to step out of the pyramid. What happened was Larry Grayson at the top, symbolic of this Illuminati, ended up in the second row because <laughs> the whole pyramid collapsed because one yeah. little guy on the left-hand bottom corner got a cough. Lovely. You know, the, the pyramid power um, in one way is all roads from the base of the pyramid lead up to the point of the pyramid and that's how they control. The thing that I would like to... to, to, to connect up with this it's so interesting what you're saying and 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 we we passionately agree with your with your thesis here and one of the things which i love about your work is that it's like in order to control or rather one good way to control somebody is to lie to them and therefore if somebody you know if you're being lied to then someone is trying to control you these things are are, are intimately connected right and we are being uh, convinced that this reality is all that there is, that these are just animated hunks of meat that yeah, last exactly. for three score years and ten, and, that's, and then that's a lot. And then, and then either we're pushing up daisies or we go to heaven or go to hell, which yeah. is another trap and another lie. Absolutely. And meanwhile, there's some fascinating things going on behind the scenes. And as you must have known from from your own research and your own contact and your own conversations, that you've got a magical component to the controllers, meant in the real definition of the word magic. Black magic ceremonies, rituals, sacrifices, all kinds of things that you and I don't want to know about, but actually this is part of the truth of the matter. This is what they do. They evoke jinns, right. they do strange things, yeah, they influence I've people at distance. did an enormous amount of stuff about that in the late 90s. And it's not pleasant to look at, and it's real. And then there's another aspect of this, which is something that's been coming at us quite a lot from, from Black Projects Insiders, who, uh, which is not the black magic, but the black technology, which was well stated by Richard Hoagland, who told us that he'd had a phone call from, from an insider who said that they would rather lose an American city than give up their new physics. And this new physics, we were told by somebody who we met in Thailand in October. Uh, we've given him the pseudonym of Jake Simpson. We know the guy very well. He said that the state of black physics at the moment is, when I say black physics, it's like secret physics, mm -hmm. as in black operations. Yeah. Um, those guys are not all evil people, but they're on the inside. Um, and they're playing these games with all the resources and all the knowledge that is denied the public domain, right. 10,000 years ahead of public sector physics, let's say, accelerating away from public sector knowledge at the rate of 1,000 years a year. And I checked those figures with him. That's a lot of zeros, 10,000 years ahead. And he told us, for instance, that 
the technology exists to phase shift soldiers, special forces soldiers, so that they can walk through walls. Yeah, I've heard is, that. Which is quite... You... I've heard that. You've heard that? Years. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Yeah, it's an interesting corroboration. These little stories pop up yeah. here and there in different researchers. And I think the thing is, um, Bill, that the reason for the vast acceleration is there's a critical point where you understand reality. And from that point, the potential just absolutely soars. Whereas because of the suppression of science in the public arena, they're nowhere near yet that line where, where, yes. where the potential soars. So they've, the, in the secret projects, they've crossed that line and, and therefore they are, they're accelerating away at the rate you talk about from, um, from mainstream scientific understanding. That's exactly right. And they're working There's with a guy... interdimensional intelligences sure. to have gotten to that Absolutely place. Absolutely right. What it's, it's, it's really a key and ETs uh, negative, you know, service to self ETs, basically, that they're, you know, working with. And certainly um, becoming aware of the, you know, the veil behind the veil, you know, because you can talk about consciousness and mind as, as we have here, but if you want to lay out, you know, if you want to understand what's really going on, you do have to talk about ETs and you have to talk about interdimensional entities and and also sure you know, um, mm. um entities that that don't um have physical bodies sure that's what um, i was saying earlier you've got we've got to do this on all levels because yeah. it's operating and the on best all presentation levels. which i heard of the answer to one of the most important questions and i can't remember whether it was yourself or jordan maxwell or, or perhaps both who said how could humans do the things that they do to other humans on this planet as they seem to really be doing? How could we be trashing this planet, our home, in the way that we are at the behest of the controllers? How could humans be doing this? And the answer is that actually they're not human at the highest level. Is this something that you said or was that... No, that was, uh, that's a theme that I've been talking about for a while because... You know, this reality, we keep talking about different levels. This reality opens, uh, uh, operates on different levels. Um, you've got the, the uh, wave uh, vibrational level, you've got the electromagnetic level, you've got the visible light level, and uh, you've got the digital level. Mm. And uh, you, when you talk about the level of advancement and potential that, that you mentioned earlier, it is a cinch to, if you look at where the development of artificial intelligence is moving now within this stone age level of awareness. You imagine what is possible at the, the, the cutting edge of the secret projects and, and even beyond that in the, the realms of um, the non-human uh, levels of this. And th they have without question the ability to create um, artificial intelligence. Mm that looks to our, in the decoded world, because I'm decoding you now, mm. what you are is a vibrational field. So if you can create a vibrational field with artificial intelligence that is vibrating uh, externally in the same uh, uh, form, range, um, that a human body is, because basically it's a biological computer human body, but, but what's animating it is different to, to what animates us then I'm going to decode you or I'm going to decode this artificial intelligence just like the lady in the red dress in the Matrix movie. Exactly. And she's going to look just like you and me. And I remember being in that ayahuasca state um, in 2003 and this, that female voice said to me, um, if you programmed a computer to abuse a child, would the computer have any emotional consequence for that, any emotional reaction? None. It would just do what it's programmed to do. And one of the most blatant things about these Illuminati bloodlines is they have no empathy. They have no ability to empathize with the consequences for others of their actions. That's why there are no limits. You know, pepper bombing Baghdad to us, horrific, terrific emotional consequence. To them, nothing. Just like a computer. And they are like computers. Um, and to um, a large extent, that's why they, they are, some of them are so, so bright. You know, I, I, my computer on my desk can work things out quicker than I can in some areas where, it, where it's just, you know, working out uh, to a program. 
Um, it's not, it has no wisdom, it has no empathy, it has no uh, uh, heart or consciousness, but on a, on a mental level it can work very quickly. And these people are very sharp mentally, there's no doubt about it, some of these people are very sharp mentally, but they have no, no heart, no, no, no balancing qualities of consciousness. I'm, I'm convinced they're artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when I look at someone like Kissinger, I mean, I see an artificial intelligence of, uh, that has been created by a very, very advanced knowledge and it looks just like you and me because that's the way we decode it, you know. And, and well, you know, again, uh, Bill, when you're talking about uh, the rituals and, and, and what have you, what are the rituals doing? They're cre it's all about creating a vibrational field. They're creating an energetic environment mm. that allows these uh, uh, interdimensional entities to move into this dimension, yep. uh, at least briefly. And what they're also doing is accessing through these rituals the vibrational level of reality, which is the prime level of reality which we decode into this. Mm. Um, and, and so um, what they're doing on, a, on one level with these rituals, which they often do at vortex points, which are, uh, um, are very powerful in affecting the vibrational state of, of the planet and the, the lines of communication lines that like meridian lines that we have in the body of the planet has, if they do a ritual where a lot of these lines meet, then the vibrational effect of that ritual is going out down these lines and they're, being, they're affecting um, us because the weird, we're, we're being affected by that vibrational level, that prime level. So, um, I'm, I'm no doubt at all they've got technology too that is, that is um, creating disharmony within the vibrational level of this reality, mm -hmm. which then will create disharmony here, you know. Um, and the thing is, though, I remember this, um, that, that, that scene in The Matrix, because I, I, people read things in different ways. I, I read Neo's journey as becoming conscious. I, mean, I think that's probably what they meant, but that's, just, that's why, the way I read it very powerfully. And there was a point where he's in a simulation with um, the Morpheus character, and Morpheus is explaining about the agents. Now, for agents, read people that you're talking about that have the ability to do incredible things within this reality because they understand how it works and they keep it from the people. Right. And people who watch The Matrix will remember the scene because the agent, Agent Smith, is in freeze frame in this thing with a gun. And the Morpheus character says to uh, Neo, um, people have emptied entire clips at them and hit nothing but air, but their strength and their speed is still based on a world based on rules. And because of that, they can never be as fast or as strong as you can be. You're right. Because um, within this virtual reality, there are rules to the game. Some of them are called laws of physics and such like. Consciousness overcomes those laws, does not recognize them, is not, is not entrapped by them. So as we become conscious, we move beyond the box that the controlling force is actually in. Because during my talks, I, I, I put two boxes. One's got symbolically a reptilian on it, and a smaller one's got humans on it. Mm -hmm. What they've done, and the whole uh, foundation of how it's been possible, because they're in a box, otherwise they won't be doing what they're doing. Absolutely. And if they're artificial intelligence, they're obviously in a box with a lid on that doesn't open. But um, they've managed to control uh, human uh, society by putting humans in a smaller box than they're in. Again, we come back, uh, symbolic of the box, they're holding the ball on the bottom of the tank. Mm. As we become conscious, we go beyond their potential. Mm. And um, that's what they're terrified of. Let me tell the story about um, Bill Burns and Admiral George Hoover. Um, don't know if you've heard this one, but we'd love to tell okay. this one on camera. Okay. Bill Burns, uh, Los Angeles-based editor of UFO magazine, uh, talked to Admiral George Hoover from the Office of Naval Intelligence before he died, um, when he was an elderly man, and, and he had one of these turnaround uh, experiences when he was very old, and he started to talk to Bill Burns about what was really going on, and Bill Burns wanted to know about things like the Roswell crash, right. all, of this, all of this stuff. And one of the things that George Hoover told Bill Burns was that the Roswell crash, the, the visitors there, there were time travelers, there were us from the future, time traveling future humans, which we've heard from other sources as well. 
And the most important thing, though, the biggest secret, was how powerful we are. The consciousness we have, the ability that we have. And Bill Burns' words from George Hoover was our ability to manipulate the consciousness around us. And if we started to do that, as far as the controllers were concerned, we would create havoc. And this is what must not be known. It must not be known how powerful we are. Because the time-traveling future humans use their consciousness in order to, to bridge these dimensions. And what these disks are, according to Hoover, and also according to Philip Corso, who wrote The Day After Roswell, was that they're sort of, they're like, they're, they're, they're amplifiers and, f and focusing devices of consciousness. And the pilots are an integral part of the machine. And as any quantum physicist will tell you, its consciousness actually has the ability to determine whether Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead, whether to, to, to determine probabilistic quantum outcomes, to actually influence reality. You can't do quantum physics without taking into advantage, uh, without taking account of consciousness. And therefore this means if you have a very high control and ability in that, in that, in that, in that realm, it sort of bridges mind and consciousness, then just as great adepts are said to be able to do, you can bilocate. So, okay, so we'll do it all together, we'll do it in a craft, it'll help us, it'll amplify us, and this is what the crafts are, and this is why they were baffled when they opened up these things, they couldn't find an engine. My, uh, that, that female voice in the ayahuasca experience said to me, um, why do you fly in a plane? when you're only flying through yourself. Right? <laughs> exactly. And, and um, yeah. Yeah. what came to mind when you were talking there, uh, Bill, was um, the, the, the carry-on of that scene in The Matrix um, with the Agent Smith, where we are saying, never be as strong and fast as you can be. And then the Neo character says, um, do you mean I'll be able to dodge bullets? No, Neo. When you're ready, you won't have to. Mm. Controlling your... Um, experience. Yes. You know, you don't have to dodge bullets. You, you're going to make sure no one ever shoots at you. You want in a position where you have to dodge yeah. bullets. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, people have said to me so many times over the years, right from the early days, why aren't you dead? And it, it may sound, I don't, you know, I, I can only say what I, what I know it, deep inside. They can't. They can't. They can't. They can't. They can't. Um, if we um, were coming to do something and all it took was for someone to shoot a bullet and it's all over, what's the point? Mm -hmm. They can't. What I, would, what I would say very strongly, and it's coming more and more into my life, there is an X factor which um, I don't understand yet, but I sure as hell know is there. And it's an X factor which is going to um, bring an end to this uh, childish playground nonsense of human control. Um, Do you mean an external influence? There's something, something I'm absol I absolutely, at a deep level, I know it. Um, and um, when I ever I think about it, whenever I think uh, about what I'm talking about now, what I see clearly is um, the planet with a a, a cell prison around it and a big lock and a key going in and I'll tell you a funny story well a funny story I'll tell you a story um, I was feeling so strongly about this um, about two weeks ago and immediately after I went on the internet and I'm going through I'm looking for a picture for my talk and in front of me was a planet in a prison cell with a big uh, lock on it which said master on it and a key going in. And that X factor, that master key, hmm. it's coming, it's coming. And it's not gonna come like cavalry to save everything, but it is a big factor in, I'm absolutely convinced that the end of this prison society is a done deal. I think mm. the outcome is gonna happen. I think it's meant to happen. And um, uh, we're now seeing, and it will go on for a while, but we're now seeing the last throes of a dying um, system. 
um, where the Illuminati in their box are believing they're crashing the system to create something else when it's actually crashing ultimately for another reason. Is there a real danger because you've got a cornered tiger that a cornered tiger that at its most dangerous when it's cornered? Is that possible? Oh, uh, these people in their panic are, are, are going to thrash out in all bloody directions. Um, but um, you know that's just part of this transition from where we are to where we're going. And the thing is that you know you can look at the news and you can see the conspiracy moving on. Um, in Britain it's just getting ridiculous, but what you don't see on the news, and therefore it's not in your awareness, um, is how fast the awakening mm. from the amnesic sleep is moving on. And um, it's moving on dramatically quickly. And, and I'm not saying that tomorrow the sun's going to come up and everything's going to be fine. You know, we're deeply into a transitional period here and there's going to be a lot of um, uh, challenges and uh, this thing's going to move on further. But um, the outcome, I think, is a done deal. This is going down and, and uh, then we can start to create a new society based on consciousness values rather than the limitations of mind. And I would just say this because I think this is important from my point of view, it's important. I think, you know, there's a great danger that this 2012 thing is going to be a massive, massive diversion. It's a spirit to a Y2K. <laughs> that's, that's what I, I've called it actually, a spiritual Y2K um, myself. And me of all people who saw a psychic in 1990 and was told that vibrational change was coming. I, of all people, should be saying, yeah, look, 2012, that's it. It's more evidence, the vibrational change, the transformation. Uh, I cannot sync with that at, at all. And what, what's slightly concerning is that the number of emails I get and other people I know, uh, websites get, of people saying, what's the point of doing anything because it's all going to change in 2012. Well, I mean, that's, that's like Obama selling hope, which is always the... the the horse in front on the carousel, no matter how fast you, you go round, you never get closer to the horse in front. That's what hope does. What hope is, especially in the way Obama uses it, and um, what Y2K uh, 2012 has the deep potential of becoming, is a holding, pat, a holding position where people who could be um, uh, doing something now just wait around again. What is 2012 mm. symbolically? It's the cavalry coming. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Hey, hey, the cavalry's here. It's not coming, it's here. Right. <coughs> the cavalry needs sense. to get on its horse, by the way, uh, uh, incidentally, and stop uh, waiting for another one to come. It's exactly, I mean, it's like Neo in the place where he is at, where he realizes that he has the ability to become all that is and therefore bullets pass through him because he's, he's no longer there, there. Right. Um, he's actually everywhere. And, and that, in a sense, I mean, I know it's words, but in a sense that is the key that we all hold. And what's happening, in a sense, is with the wave, there's actually a facilitation that's happening. Um, we've been told by various people, but one in particular, uh, Jake Simpson, who has been on the inside, talks about regardless of how you view the future, this wave of energy is actually coming towards our planet, or you could view it as our planet solar system is moving into this energy. It is coming. So it's like, it's like if you're surfing and you know a wave is coming, there's whole groups of people on the planet getting ready to ride the wave. And so in a sense, they have to have the key in order to ride, ride the wave. In a sense, you could say the surfboard, the consciousness, the key to understanding who they are and what consciousness really is and how they're united, which is part of the key. Yeah. Because we are sure. united. You see, if, if we know that we are everywhere, then, and we're totally linked up. See, I'm in this body right now, you're in that body right now, and between us looks like there's empty space. But in reality, this is consciousness. This space is incorporated. So there is actually no break between you and I and, and Bill here. 
We're this, all in this sea of consciousness. The three tips of the same iceberg. That's why, you know, becoming conscious is the bottom line of everything. If we don't become conscious and move into these realms of understanding uh, the sort of stuff you're talking about, that we're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively, life is only a dream and, uh, uh, you know, matter is just, uh, you know, energy condensed to a slow vibration, as Bill Hicks used to say. Unless we, we come from this perspective, then what, what, what's the key thing of any dictatorship? It's divide and rule. And so what they, what the whole basis of what they're doing is taking consciousness, 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 and um, dividing it in upon itself. You know, what, we, what we're seeing here is, is, is basically consciousness so manipulated that it's at war with itself. Um, because it's come to a so, it's been brought to such a low level of awareness compared with its potential. Mm -hmm. And so the spiritual and the streetwise, the five sense uh, conspiracy and the uh, understanding of the nature of reality, they've got to go together. And, you know, for too long they've been apart. And people said, oh, spiritual, that's new age. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's credible. That's, uh, well, what are we saying? Spiritual, that's new age. Or um, is the credible, you know, because and all that stuff. These things <coughs> have to come together because as one unit, they're unstoppable. Apart, again, divide and rule, yeah. they, they have a fraction of their potential power for change. Yes. If, people, if people come from the heart, they'll know what to do. Exactly. If people come from the head, it will tell them a long list of things why there's nothing they can do or why there's um, no point in doing them. Um, it's, we're, at a, we're at a fork in the road and, you know, symbolically, because it's a balance of the two that we're looking for ideally here, yeah. but symbolically, it's the choice between the head and the heart. Let's say head domination or heart domination of our sense of reality. Um, and if we take the heart um, route, then this world will transform from a manifestation of mind to a manifestation of consciousness. Has to, because this is just a projection. This has to follow what goes on here. If we, if we take the choice of mind, then um, we're going to live in a, a global version of Nazi Germany. My, um, my, my strong feeling is, although we're going to go closer to a global version of Nazi Germany, um, ultimately um, the whole thing will collapse because uh, the awakening will cease to hold it together. If you were a betting man, what would you say the time scale of events, the rollout will be over the next one, two, three, five, ten years? If you're a historian, what do you think you'd be writing about? I'd say, and I'm probably being optimistic, I'd say we, we would live in a global version of Nazi Germany within ten years, if we take that route. Mm -hmm. If we take that route, we'll, in ten years' time, be um, deeply into a transition to a very different world. It's just a choice, but this X factor is going to help us to um, to change the world to one that I would like to live in. Don't know what the X factor is, but I know it's coming. It'll be fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, David. Thank, thanks, Terry. Fabulous. It's been a, a, David, a pleasure. Thank thanks, you Bill. So much. Cheers. Looking forward to the future. Yeah, that's a good wrap. And the future is now. And the future is now. And always was.